And so we've applied for a conditional use permit and rezoning application through the city of Santa Rosa to be able to convert the Warwick Hospital sitting vacant again into up to 63 affordable housing units in our community. That is just a little drop in the bucket in terms of the need. The wait list for Tamayo Village could fill that almost instantly with what we're looking at now in terms of the need that exists and it keeps on coming. That bottleneck that we've been talking about just continues to grow and grow. So we have an opportunity to be able to help Jeremy, help these young people that are on the streets of Sonoma County by providing much needed additional affordable housing in the form of the SAY Dream Center. Sure, not a problem. Um, first off, you have to understand I've been an attorney here in Santa Rosa County, or Sonoma County, Santa Rosa, for 37 years. When I came here in 1976, I had been in New Orleans, Louisiana, where I went to law school, and working for legal services, upgrading discharges for Vietnam veterans, which was a little known skill. Turns out that I was good at it. And when I came here in 1976, I approached a group that was then, if you're old enough, you may remember him as Flower of the Dragon. And that was a group of Vietnam veterans helping themselves, the first group in the nation, followed by a few months later by a group in San Francisco called Swords to Plowshares, or STP. Both organizations are still here, but Flower of the Dragon, the name, used to upset people. We were a bunch of long-haired geeks wearing damaged flak jackets. Well, our hair got shorter, mine got whiter, and we changed our name to Vietnam Veterans of California. We are now, and I say we, I'm no longer with, because after 35 years, my wife said, let somebody else do a lot of the work. I was either of counsel, on the board, or I'm very honored to say for 11 and a half years, I was chairman of the board. During that period of time, through some very, very legal shenanigans. John Kerry helped us. He was a senator at the time. Now he happens to be our secretary of state of this nation. Helped us secure a house, a building that we turned around and sold to Hewlett Packard. And it's an interesting story. But with our own money, we bought land, built a transitional house, not a warehouse for the homeless, but a transitional house in Sacramento, just off Florin Road. It's in an industrial area. We own the building. We own the land. And partnering with Packard Bell, we brought in 25 Vietnam veterans. You remember them. They were on the street corner with a little cardboard sign. Nam Vet will work for food. Help me. And we did. We opened it, we put in 25 beds, Packard Bell got 20 computers and brought in people twice a week. They took someone as stupid as I am with computers, I can't make mine work, my paralegal does, and taught them in a three month period so that they could qualify for basic IT. I've learned what that means, information technology. It's a good job. You start at 37.5 if you're up at Hewlett Packard. That's real money. And we would take them and train them. We had drug testing, not only when they came in, but random through their whole stay. One mistake, 30 days tested every day, second mistake, you're out. You want to be there? You want to grow? 
That's a true transitional housing. We partnered with Sacramento Paratransit. We actually wound up some of our men became drivers so that they could be picked up at this place on Florin Road, go down Freeport Boulevard to the Sacramento Junior College. They had a GED program on campus as well as, of course, your preemptory classes so that you could then transfer to a four-year university. Drug testing, on site. We managed it. The people were not volunteers. I'm sure a lot of you are volunteers and your heart's in the right place. You might have the best dentist in the world, but don't let him work on the brakes on your car. He doesn't know what he's doing. So just wanting to help is not good enough. You have to have the training. We did. We then grew. From 25, we added a second wing of 25 more. And five years after this, this opened in 93. And five years after that, we opened the very first wing for female Vietnam veterans, virtually every one of which was in the medical corps, virtually every one of which suffered and struggled with PTSD. So fast forward to, fast forward to now. We always said if we did our job right, we would put ourselves out of business. Well, the government made sure that there were more wars and more veterans. It's now almost fully staffed uh, with Afghanistan veterans and Iraqi veterans. It's still ongoing. It is the way to do a transitional house. What is proposed, unfortunately, for the Warwick warehouse does not have all of these, and it requires all of them. If you just put Band-Aids on something, you still have the infection. If you don't root out the infection, you're not going to get anywhere. I oppose it as it's planned. At this project, what do you see as the sort of summary? Well, it's simple. It's a large piece of land. It's worth a bundle. Sell it. Take the money because the California State Department of Mental Health says the best transitional housing is less than 10 residents with a trained staff. With that money, you can place places that are closer to the JC. To get from Warwick to the JC or to Lewis, that's continuing education next door to the JC. Takes at least two buses, sometimes three. I've done it, it takes an hour and four minutes. You're asking somebody to donate more than two hours of their time just to get English 1A. That isn't gonna fly. Put it closer, put it where the jobs are, put it where the education is, and as the officer can tell you, Make sure you get rid of the meth. Test it. Make sure it's not there and keep it out. If you do those things, the people that need the help will be given a help, not a handout. And that's what they need. I think we can all agree that some housing is needed, some, some help is needed. Oh, and no, absolutely. There's, that isn't the question. Yeah, it's the application. Okay, so it's the application. So but this particular site you're saying is too big. So the question is, if not here, where? Everywhere. Don't put it into one lump sum. It's going to feed upon itself. Separate them out, address them as individuals, and help them. Don't just cover them up. Okay, okay well, uh, thank you, Ms. Jensen. We're going to, uh, I'm sure that we uh, can talk more about that. I do want to get to uh, Mr. Cornell. Um, uh, Chuck, you are at the other end of the continuum of, of, uh, of care and housing for, for low-income Sonoma County residents, Burbank manages hundreds of, of rentals, affordable rentals uh, throughout the county. county. We've talked here about this bottleneck. In term, uh, from, from your perspective, where is the bottleneck happening? Where is that? Where is the back? Yeah. Um, thanks. Yes, Burbank Housing is a, an affordable um, housing developer, both rental and sweat equity in Sonoma County, and we've been, been around since about 1980. And in that time, we've developed about 2,800 units in, in uh, Sonoma County, um, in almost 60 properties around the county. Um, and um, we, we partner at the, at the, at the end, as, as you mentioned, of the spectrum um, of housing, people going from homelessness to market rate housing. We're sort of toward the tail end um, and we partner with nonprofits, all of whom are, or, or many of them whom are, whom are here, uh, and many others. Uh, um, and we partner with them by setting aside um, units in our properties uh, for their client uh, population. And this, this allows them to move into a, um, a higher level of housing and move on off to, 
to market rate into our society at large. So um, this this has uh, been a been a practice at Burbank for since its beginning, and we have um, um, probably 15 percent or 20 percent of our, our units are set aside for for nonprofits uh, um, and service providers. Um, but but in the downturn that's recently occurred, and what we've seen is. Um, um, our wait lists have, have you know, ballooned uh, for our housing. Um, we have 7,400 people that, um, uh, on, our, on our wait list, again, for the 2,800 units that we, that we manage. Um, but of course, there's, you know, most people stay in their units, so there's really only about one unit that turns over every day in our portfolio, so maybe 360 turnover in a year. So, so clearly, to take care of, uh, of the wait list of 7,400 people, you know, it's 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 a, it's a long a long wait, um, and and so um, I think I think the important thing to keep in mind is that there is this bottleneck, and it's it's a bottleneck really, um, as Gentleman mentions, uh, that presents prevents people from leaving you know the transitional housing shelters and and getting to to our housing, um, and and of course that um, going to what Supervisor Zane said um, it goes back to funding. Uh, right now, we, we've finished our, our last rental project um, last mid last year um, um, that we can build at this time. That there, there isn't enough funding to to build the um, the projects that we already have in our pipeline, um, uh, and so as a result, uh, you know, we, we're just going to have to maintain you know with the population that we serve uh, and the units we serve we have, and, and, and so I think the, the the important thing it comes back to is funding. And, and a question might be, well, where is funding? Well, you know, certainly the, the local municipalities have, um, have a lot of financial constraints. Um, and, and, and however, at the state level, there is an initiative, SB 391, which is the uh, Homes and Jobs Act, which would create a permanent source for um, affordable housing in the state of California. Um, it would raise some maybe $500 million a year and, and would be an important source that local municipalities could leverage on to complete this, this housing and, and help, help stop the bottleneck. Um, one last thing I'd like to mention, and, and, um, and that is the really critical role that the service providers play in um, providing services to those people who move into our properties. Um, they often need, need support. They, they don't just need housing, as, as, as Mike mentioned. They don't just need housing, they need, they need housing and support. They need some guidance, and, and to have uh, funding for those support services, I think, is really key yeah. to the success of, of, of a person. Like a lot of what we're hearing, it's not just giving them a roof, it's giving right. them training, support, encouragement, meals, jobs, mm -hmm. phones, everything, yeah. and, and hope. And from your perspective, it sounds like you really have two, two major problems. One is the housing market being what they are, low vacancy, low vacancy rates out there in market rate housing, so people aren't transitioning your units in the market rate housing, therefore nobody can get out of transitional housing of yours, and nobody can get out of rich shelters in transitional housing. Mm -hmm. The second issue being with the loss of redevelopment, there's no real mechanism for <coughs> funding future construction projects. Yeah, that's a very good, very good point. Yeah, yeah that's okay, very so true. We're talk about that. Good. Okay, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Let's have a round of applause. <laughs> I'm sitting right in front because I have some comments and some thoughts. And one thing is, I love what you said, Matt, about here we are, right? And my fear is that I'm going to walk out of this room today not having signed up for anything, not having volunteered for anything, not knowing where to go to be of service myself. You know, so, I mean, you've given us a lot of inspiration, but now what? So, good. Um, so, you know, and, and also, Supervisor Zane, when you, I love, I love your humanity and I love your tears because I have them too, and that's our humanity here. 
And so it, you know, there's mental Ill, illness programs have been cut, drug programs have been cut, which is at the source. So what I'd like to know and what I'd like to see is something like, uh, you know, the great in labor, you go there if you want to hire somebody. How can we become sponsors? How can we be the ones that can offer support? You know, how can we, instead of adopting a highway, adopt a human being? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> And the other issue is how can people get more involved? I love it. I love the idea of adopting a person instead of a pothole. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I wanted to say something. First of all, actually, if you go across the street, there's a, a place called The Living Room that provides a drop-in shelter for women and children. And there's a lot of them. There's about over 200 clients. These are homeless women and children who drop in there every day. They need people to cook them meals, teach them skills, classes, rebuild their confidence so they can go out and get jobs and education, take care of their children. So I'll just write right off the bat. But I w did want to say something about mental health parity under the Affordable Health Care Act because there's some hope here. Um, under the Mental Health Parity Act, um, people who are under the Medicaid or Medi-Cal system, um, the federal government has now have, has to uh, provide parity for mental health and substance abuse services. That's to me is one of the golden eggs of affordable health care, despite what you think about affordable health care. That is good news. <laughs> and. I don't know, is Rita still here? Rita Scardacci? Did, is Rita here? Yeah, Rita Scardacci, our Director of Health Services, who gave me this daffodil to remind me of Hope um, earlier. We were able to hire 23, just in the last uh, two months, mental health workers and substance abuse counselors because of the Affordable Health Care Act, 23 more at the county. So. And we've spent over $8 million through the, those federal dollars to expand in terms of capital investments, our health care clinics that are all expanding in this whole area of substance abuse and mental health. And what we know is that a lot of our homeless, um, they, again, they don't have services. They, do, they will go to the clinics often. And all of those clinics are expanding under affordable health care. And so we are pumping money into those so that everybody in this county has access to health care. Because one of the things that was mentioned earlier about public health, what happens is that when you're homeless, it cuts your lifespan by 25 years. It is a public health crisis. 25 years. Same with serious mental health illnesses, too. I brought some pictures, and I know somebody was going to pass them along. There you are. <laughs> and just pass them around, take a look at them. They're before and after pictures of people who got housing. And they actually came from a segment on 60 Minutes the other night. Um, that talked about the whole issue of providing housing first. It's great, people need services, but provide housing first, for God's sakes. So, yeah. That's I'll get you. Yeah, can you hear me? I got one over here. Uh, I, I wanted to mention that growing out of the homeless problem is a very important aspect, and Burbank has touched on that as far as the housing goes. But what I'm talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, what I'm talking about is an enterprise zone. And the proposed annexation of Roseland is a very important question. There's a lot of currency right now. We have an opportunity to look at that as a glass half full, not as a glass half empty. The whole of Main Street in Roseland, Sebastopol Road, should be declared an enterprise zone, inviting small businesses in there, all kinds of mom and pop shops, 
and especially hostels where you can get a room for $10 a night, $5 a night, make it work, have it subsidized, whatever it takes. And there are too many regulations and taxes that prevent this. And there are certain groups who would rather have salamanders live than homeless people live. And there are homeless people who are dying in our streets because of that. Well, that's Shame. Uh, that's passionate and vivid, certainly. Uh, it's like so sure enterprise zones. That's right. Thank All you right. very much. Can I get a question over here? Thank you. Uh, my name is Don Nowacki, and I've been a homeless advocate for the past 40 years. Uh, the past six years, I was on the board of Catholic Charities, working with Jenny Lynn, and now I'm with St. Vincent de Paul. We have the kitchen here near Railroad Square, and every day we feed a nutritious lunch. Uh, the other day, we had 345 men, women, and children. Last year, at the same time, we were averaging like 200 people. So you could see this homelessness and this keeps growing and growing. Now, uh, one thing I've learned in the past many, many decades in working with the homeless, uh, I originally uh, lived in Marin County for many years. We had a very serious homeless problem there. Uh, we kept looking for land to build a homeless shelter. It wasn't until they decommissioned Hamilton Air Force Base that the government gave us four acres. And a small group of us, inside of 11 months, raised three and a half million dollars and built a homeless shelter at Hamilton Air Force Base. It's called New Beginnings. And if you look at the computer and look up Homeward Bound, I would like to see us in Sonoma County do everything that the people did in Marin County, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel there's really three uh, pieces, or I call it legs to the chair. Uh, the one is to find a place and build a shelter. That's number one. And the funding is always there, believe me. Uh, I worked for Fireman's Fund. I asked my boss for a $100,000 check. He wrote out the check. That started the ball rolling. The Buck Trust, the community uh, uh, foundation, uh, matched us dollar for dollar after the first million dollars was raised. So money is not the problem. The site is having the, the location because of nimbyism. Uh, but the, the, the other thing that's uh, very important, I find, that you can't just warehouse the people. At, ho at Homeward Bound in Marin County, what they do is they're educating the people on a day-to-day -day basis. They're finding them jobs, they're helping them uh, train in culinary arts, computerization, on and on. So it's like a revolving door. Rather than having a backlog of people trying to get in, 80% of the people that find themselves homeless, once they enter the program and they're educated and they have coached a career like Jenny Lynn does at uh, Catholic Charities, once they get a job, then they move on to transitional housing and then further. So uh, I would like to see us just kind of duplicate what, we're, well, what we've done in Marin County, here in Sonoma County. Yeah, and you have real-world experience from our neighbor just down the road. Uh, and I appreciate you sharing that. That was uh, instructive. Uh, and I think that we're going to get to see a Yeah, I'd like to address that. I, um, I think there are agencies like COTS and Catholic Charities that are operating systems of care that are very similar um, and in, in some cases more effective than Homeward Bound in Marin. Um, COTS, for example, um, has a, uh, a model we call restorative integral support, which is a wraparound services model that addresses the root causes of homelessness um, adds in things like accountability, testing, you know, drug testing, career counseling, mental health, uh, physical health, and so forth and so on. The goal being to, to help somebody transition from a state of homelessness and crisis to permanent stability and housing for the long term. 
So these systems do exist. Um, Catholic Charities is doing very much the same thing, and even on a larger scale than COTS is or Homeward Bound down in Marin. So the, the systems of care are very effective. They're just not big enough, first of all, to absorb all of the folks that are out on the street now. And no matter what we do in terms of efficacy, we could be graduating 100% of the people that go through our programs every year and still have no place to put them all when they leave. So the silver bullet is not more shelters. The silver bullet is more affordable housing. And I just wanted to add, thank you, Jenny Lynn. It, it's a rapid rehousing program that the county has been investing in, and even more heavily so recently. And it's also kind of uh, an idea that's sweeping the nation, and it's called Housing First. And it's just simply, it's the number one stressor, as Jenny Lynn said, in, in terms of people's lives. Get them in some housing, assign a case manager to them. That's when you will see significant change. But their first need, first and foremost, is a safe shelter. And Utah has been doing it, um, and uh, other, other places have too, and hopefully we can adopt it here, but everybody's right on the panel. We first need to build about 1,000 more units of very uh, affordable um, housing for, for the very low income, if we're gonna be able to do that. I really don't have a question as another service provider for homeless um, in Sonoma County in Santa Rosa in particular. Um, Matt, I want to commend you on the work that you're trying to do for the, for the youth. Um, I think the Dream Center is a wonderful idea. You're putting all services in one location. Um, and I think that this is something that the youth of this county need. Um, you've been, it's been working at Wailupa for years. I don't see why it won't work at the Warwick Hospital. Um, you know, I, th I think we're all um, struggling with that bottleneck. Um, it is an affordable housing issue in this county. Um, all of the shelters have no place to send the families and the females or the males that we're working with. I mean, we can give them all the support services that we can, but until we get the affordable housing, um, increased in this county, we're still going to have the same problem. Um, housing first is the, uh, is the answer, um, but we need to have the housing to do that. Um, as far as volunteering, every one of us in this county would appreciate volunteers 
to support the, the people that we work with as homeless providers. So if you have it in your heart to give back to the community or become part of this community, please, any one of us, any one of these agencies would love to have you. Thank you. I, I, uh, I, Hold on. Yeah, I got a question over here. Hank, thanks for describing my life in the surface detail. My trespassing charge comes up March 11th. I know that homelessness is not illegal. The guys who wrote my ticket didn't seem to know that. They didn't act like they knew that. That's okay. Jeremy, you described really well the, what it's like to be walking down the street with nowhere to go, with everything on your back, as soon as it's daylight, and not being able to get back in the shelter till it's dark again. Mike, you really brought the homelessness, I mean, the, the hopelessness into how that feels, being alienated. One of the things you, that exists between what you two guys said is the meaning of life. Wandering down the street, hopeless, with your gear on your back and nowhere to go, life has no meaning. That 18-year-old you're talking about, when it gets dark and he goes down by the creek and somebody hands him a crack pipe or a crank pipe or a needle, what reason does he have to say no to that stuff? Two days later, he's addicted. It don't take long. So meth is part of my life. I got three weeks clean right now, Hank. Um, and right now, my tent's set up behind the VA clinic, out behind the airport. There ain't no dope in it, but it, it ain't legal yet. And uh, I don't know where to go. You know, where am I gonna go tonight? You talked about, is your name Paul? You talked about the, uh, the prefer it that way. I prefer to have a place where I can go and read my book, cook my food, to be wandering around downtown, having to wait for the shelter to open to go there at night. I prefer to have that space. I prefer to be able to go in the VA clinic three days a week and talk about why I joined the Marine Corps at 17 years old and that impression age we all talk about, clean, straight, wanted to be John Wayne and got out in 1970 doing every drug I could get my hands on. I sat with a group of veterans a day and cried my eyeballs out 43 years later. So, you have a story to say. I, I got a question yet. I said I'd ask a question. Hank, I want you to let me. I'm, I'm a, I was clean and sober for 20 years. I ran logging crews. I want you to let me take a group of guys out to Ho Homeless Hill, Farmer's Lane, and Bennett Valley Road. All I need are three port porta potties, a Holloway dumpster, and I'll clean that hill up, man. I'll take all that garbage out there, the homeless people have left for 10 years, and get it off of there. I want to do it, man. Help me figure it out. Uh, hello, I'm a homeless woman. My name is Jean. Thank you very much to Mary Isaac Center and to Sam Jones. Uh, Sam Jones, contrary to uh, what people say, is not a wet shelter. Uh, it, it was very, very well run, and so is the Mary Isaac Center. Uh, luckily, I do not have an addiction problem. I owned my own house. I lost to foreclosure. Uh, I, was, I, I was only able to get part-time work. So I've been underemployed since 2011. I am a college graduate. I have no criminal past. Yeah. I had to live in my car. I, I've, had, I've had to live in shelters. What I need is a decent paying job with benefits. That means full-time work. I've got two hands. I've got a brain. I am willing to work. What I've found is nothing but temporary work. Not temp to hire. It doesn't get your foot through the door. You are disposable. They use you for a few weeks, and then they let you go. Time after time, right now I'm working a temp job. I'm a waiver on uh, east, uh, east of Washington Street in front of uh, a tax service. It's, you know, I, I think I could do better work, but it is honest work, so I'm not ashamed of doing it. But I know I will never get away from homelessness until I get a real job. And I know this is nationwide, stagnant wages, and increasingly you cannot get a full-time full paying job with benefits. Yeah, that's it. That's I'm perfectly it. willing to work, but unfortunately I don't yeah. find the jobs out there. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a, chronic, uh, a problem in our economy right now uh, for many people. And, uh, okay. Okay. One more, one more. Um, you made reference and oh, 
And you have the pictures from the 60 minute, uh, 1,000 homes. Um, do, you, do we have the funds to not, I mean, we want to build, yes, we need more housing, but that was about, it was less expensive to pay somebody's rent than to pay for the fallout from people being on the streets. So they had everybody coming together, all the apartment owners, and they were saying, okay, I can give one apartment, I can give two apartments to this. I mean, is that even a possibility? That's one thing I wanted to say. I'm going to limit to what I really yeah, want to say. Sure. Somebody yeah. take that I, I, it is a possibility if we had more units. That's one of the problems we're facing. We do not have enough affordable units to give people um, if they're homeless. But the, the cost analysis regarding that story has been done. And interestingly enough, it costs about 70% more to not give somebody right. a place to live. Right. Because what happens is that they go to the emergency rooms. Exactly. What happens, or they get arrested, or, or as, as Hank talked about. So we pay for it in another way. If we're right. going to do what we call upstream investments, which is to invest in people's lives upstream rather than to build more jails and to pay for it downstream in healthcare costs and, and, and all of these services, then, then we've got to have that sufficient affordable housing so we get people in those places, assign a case manager to them, and, and it is cost effective. We already know the analysis. It's been done. So yeah. we, do, so we do could, have yeah, more absolutely. Um, in the meantime, there are people on the streets that can't get into the shelters for whatever reason. Um, I mean, there's a waiting list for that. Um, one question is, what's going to happen to the car parking permission?